Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to The Money Factor. I'm Richard Naylor, your host. Our topic today is Income Tax 2010. We have two guests, they are CPAs from the Marvin Company, uh, Kevin O'Leary and Tom Donovan. I want to welcome them both to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Richard. It's an annual ritual in this country that we all look forward to so much, getting those W-2s and starting off on our tax season. Almost as good as Christmas, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good reminder that tax season's around the corner. Yeah, I guess yeah. that's the only thing that's similar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, tell us first, uh, what is the Marvin Company uh, and uh, what are your specialties? Well, Marvin and Company is a CPA firm based here in upstate New York. Office is right near the Albany Airport. And the uh, firm was founded in 1923 by Charles Marvin. And uh, we're in about our fourth generation of owners right now. But uh, we're a general CPA firm. And uh, this time of year, we're doing a lot of income tax work. Right. And uh, taking care of uh, individual families, uh, small business, some large business. Uh, so we're busy this time of year. And it's probably going to get a little busier as it gets towards April 15th and past. It does. <laughs> it <laughs> the does. days get longer. <laughs> The days get longer. Our families have adjusted to that. Right, right. And uh, it's a great time of year. Uh, we, we love what we do. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we help families and individuals with their, with their income taxes and, and help manage and, and minimize their, their tax burdens. Super. Yeah. And that's, you're exactly the kind of people we need to help us figure out what's going on in uh, IRS land and I guess the state too. Mm -hmm. Let's start off by uh, taking a look at anything that you think is significant and new. Uh, I know you mentioned the government and uh, some major questions that just are not getting answered for us. So that's certainly one of them, but uh, let's get into that. Well, uh, at the time of taping of, of this show, uh, we're in what's referred to as the lame duck session. Uh, Congress is back <coughs> after the elections and uh, there's just a few weeks left before the end of the year and there are very, very many and significant tax provisions that are up for discussion. Uh, a lot of uncertainty. The, uh, the Bush tax cuts are the most popular ones that we hear about in the press, but there are a number of, number of tax-related issues that are yet to be resolved, and hopefully we'll have some great outcomes by December 31st, so that we've got more, uncertain, or more certainty uh, in what's now a, a very uncertain world as far as tax planning is concerned. So let's, let's do some examples. <clears throat> the Bush tax cuts could go, uh, well, they, would just, they could expire. Mm -hmm. They could get extended. Yep. And it could be wealthy, which is what, above 250? Because that's the number we've heard thrown around for the last three the, years. The, the 250,000 income is a threshold that, uh, that's getting a lot of, a lot of play. And that is, it, is that by household or is that by individual? That's household. Okay, so That's sometimes household. people fit together and yep. can make a big difference there. Yeah. And it's been tough from a planning standpoint, especially when we work with a lot of our clients of you know working throughout the year to try and predict as to how much tax they might owe come April of the following year. With all this uncertainty in the legislation, we always have to plan on the worst case scenario. And it's very difficult, especially now, even if they do get things passed, we only have a few days to maybe do some changes or do some last minute type things. So it's really a big burden on us throughout the year as well. But we try to stay up as much as we can on all the legislation that's out there and talk with our clients on all these different opportunities. But unfortunately, we always have to stay on the safe side of things, but it right. makes it difficult. Richard, one of the, one of the bigger things that's uh uh, that's up in the air right now is the taxation of capital gains and the taxation of certain dividends. Wanted to ask you about that because that's been changing, seemed like every year. It, it's been well, it's been fairly stable for the last okay. few years, where long-term capital gains rates for assets that you have held onto for at least a year and you're you're fortunate to sell them at a profit, you're paying tax at the federal level at 15 percent. And um, and it used to be what way up there, no? It used to be up over 30%. Uh -huh. 
So as an incentive for investors to take risk in the marketplace, uh, and instead, just not stocks and bonds, it could be real estate, it could be collectibles, um, you know, long-term capital assets. Um, if the Bush tax cuts are not extended, that 15% rate is expected to settle somewhere, somewhere around 25%. That's almost all the way back. Almost all almost. the way back. Wow. Yep. And, and we saw a sign of some of the uncertainty just recently, the very, very large stock sale, an executive from Microsoft sold $1.3 billion of his stock, uh, and he still has plenty of stock left, yeah. but he was looking for diversification and he was doing some tax planning. He was taking a chance, and likely it was a good, a good move on his part, um, he'll pay his tax at 15% uh, in 2010. It's done, okay. It's done, it's behind him. He's got no uncertainty because he knows his tax will be 15%. Um, if he held off and he sold that same stock next year, the year after, mm -hmm. it could end up costing him or could have cost him another $300 million. More perhaps. money than most of us will ever make. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We'll ever have to worry about. But, but that's a sign of what's going on in the marketplace, that some people are opting now to pay their tax because of the uncertainty, figuring the taxes aren't going to be going any lower. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll pay my tax now and take my lumps and, and move on. So if anybody in doubt, it, it might be a good play to go ahead and sell. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, Anything else besides the, well, dividends? You mentioned dividends as well. Anything with that? Uh, certain dividends, domestic, uh, domestic dividends or dividends paid by domestic companies uh, generally or get a preferred tax rate of 15%. That too, that rate that is would, at risk. That oh, could wow. jump up also. And that's been an area where in the stock market some people have predicted maybe that's a good place to put the money, the larger companies with the dividends. So there's a huge tax consequence to that position. Yeah, especially yep. in the sense of um, Elderly individuals who rely on that income, you know, their fixed income. More individuals, conservative. They've more always paid exactly. their dividends. Right. The GEs, things of that nature. And um, if you all of a sudden you went from 15% to 25, the, and there's even some thought that it could go higher out there, uh, it could, could, could scare a lot of people into maybe selling now to get out and moving their money somewhere else. Wow. So that's not good news. <laughs> Do you have any good news or anything possible that would be helpful? Well, that well, might be an unfair question. <laughs> <laughs> Some good news is that, uh, uh, you know, with regards to, you know, tax rates in general, we're, we're hoping and expecting, and, and everything's still up in the air, but we're hoping that there'll be some compromise, um, and, and hopefully the tax rates on our regular earned income, our W-2 income, our income from our business earnings, um, the government will hopefully extend some of the incentives for people to, to invest in their business, to buy some equipment. Kevin wanted to comment about some of the business uh, aspects of what's going on legislatively, but uh, there are some incentives there for energy efficiency, uh, for reinvesting in your businesses. Those are some great things and those are good news. Okay. Yeah. Now, on the, go ahead on the business. Yeah, on the business side of things, um, there's always been some tax advantageous um, write-offs, I guess you could call them, with regards to purchasing of new equipment, things like that, some capital additions to grow your business. And in the, in the past few years, we've there's always been some uncertainty whether that was going to continue, increase, decrease. And the years that and, you could And the do years, it yeah. And, and um, so for 2010, um, it, to inspire corporations to go out and invest in new capital and new assets, they're, they're giving up. Uh, you have the capability to write off um, $500,000 of assets that normally would be depreciated over a length of period, five years, seven years. So if you bought $500,000 of equipment, let's say, instead of being able to take just even numbers, $100,000 each year for the next five years, you could actually write it all off in the current year. There are th thresholds and on different levels you have to worry about as well. Um, for example, if you end up buying over $2.5 million worth of assets, you start to lose some of that okay. benefit. But it's, it's for small businesses out there that, that may be having a pretty good year in 2010, 
and they're thinking about maybe purchasing some equipment maybe in the early part of 11 or mid, you know, it might be beneficial to push that into 2010. So it gives them one more tool. Um, if right. they feel they're going to have much higher income later, it might be better to wait. But, to wait, right. It, but in this case, it, it, it may just be a really good thing. Right, and, that, and that's something that it's, so, it's, it's amazing how many times in our, in our business we say the word, it depends. Because it, it just, it, it's so many, I mean, you could look at it like the standpoint of, hey, I want to reduce my income now, so I want to save tax now. But if you may be in a tax bracket that's 3% higher next year and everything else stays the same, well, yeah, maybe I might want to leave it out there to 2011. Um, so there's all these things that are out there that it's so hard for us to just say, this is how it's going to be. It, it always comes down to, it depends, it depends, it depends, because it really does. Now, you mentioned the word tax bracket. Are they changing, or is that just still the same as it was this past year? Well, the, the brackets themselves will, will be fairly comparable, uh, 2010 versus 2009. Some indexing, you know, for inflation. Um, 2011, and again, it's the uncertainty of what's going to happen with the rates, but they're projected, they're projected if the Bush tax cuts are not extended, uh, most people will see on average about a 3% increase in the tax rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, the brackets will be fairly comparable. The 10% the bracket that some people enjoy, that will be gone, and that will be converted back to 15%. Mm -hmm. So well, more people are going to be paying taxes then. Is that what that means? Well, there are still some pretty significant tax credits available. There are millions of people millions of people in the in the country that don't pay any income tax because of different exemptions and deductions that they have. But uh, some people that have enjoyed that 10 percent rate, they'll see a, a almost a 50 percent increase in their tax rate when they go to 15 percent. Wow. <laughs> Some yeah, you big know, you, numbers. You can make a mistake between 15 and 50, but if you have to pay the difference, it's a pretty big amount. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Yep, definitely. And, and we're, we're somewhat biased being professionals, but we would, we would suggest, that, and it's unfortunate that the tax code at both the federal and the state level is way too complicated. It's, uh, it's out of control. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but yes, people do need to seek professional advice because it's very easy to misinterpret to make mistakes when, when you're doing your tax return on your own. Yeah. Uh, be careful, there are, there are some great software packages out there that people can use from home and uh, prepare their taxes, but you have to take your time and be careful and diligent with that because um, pushing the wrong button, you might like the outcome, but you might have pushed the wrong button <coughs> and put the wrong attributes in that, in that software. And that sounds like good advice for anybody, whether they are filling it out with their pencil on their computer or with the on, online e kind of filing or the software, you really need to go slowly and read every word, right? I mean, if that's part of the reason why we need help because it's so easy to make mistakes. Yeah, and it's in in, in firms and accounting firms. I mean, we have numerous of people kind of double checking and looking things over because you know the last thing we want is to have. Any reason for You're not any, to make government, a yeah, any governmental agency <laughs> to take a double look at something, but a lot of people who self-prepare they don't have that double check. They 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 do it on themselves during the rush of life. Everything's going on. Everybody's nervous enough as it is dealing with these things, you know. So I think they take for granted sometimes how much really goes into this process. And you know, it, as simple as we I saw one time where someone put the the cost, they sold some stock, they put the proceeds in the cost column and the cost in the proceeds column and then sent it in and, and nothing matched the IRS records so they got a notice. And it's just simple things like that that can really sway something one way or the other. Um, so it's, it, there's a process and you know, this, you know, our firm has a foundation that we've been doing these things like this for a long, long time. And so the, the double checking and making sure that we're up with code and you know, we pay a lot of money for our software. It's not the stuff you can buy off the shelf. You know? So that, that all goes into a great product and, and it's, it's, it's tough for people on their own to, to duplicate. To do that well, yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, Kevin, you mentioned people being nervous about taxes. Um, just another cautionary word for your viewers. Um, we've seen in our office and at our home on our home computers, we've seen what looks like very legitimate email coming from Internal Revenue Service mm. telling us about refund opportunities. They usually do usually do refund opportunities. No. They do not. <laughs> they do not. 
Um, the IRS uh, will contact you by mail. Uh, they will not send you emails offering tax refunds. <laughs> Sale. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can forward those uh, fishing expedition type right. of emails. You can forward them to the IRS because they have dedicated people that are pursuing those culprits that are out there preying upon innocent mm -hmm. uh, computer users. Um, and they look good. I mean, we've seen a couple where they have the symbol. I mean, it looks very, very authentic, but I mean, from the standpoint of, it says right on the IRS website itself, irs.gov, which is a great resource for anybody. It says right there that they do not send any correspondence over emails. And they're, you know, the phishing scams are smart to use it as a refund because, you know, if they said you owe us money, no one would reply right. anyways. Right. So they know what they're doing and they look very, very good. You know. since, since we're on the, uh, the online part, let's go into the e-filing. Then mm -hmm. we can come back to some of the other things mm -hmm. uh, sure. about housing and things. But they've been pushing us for a long time to e-file. Uh, a lot of times it says free, but then when I go on, it's not free. So I end up with my pencil, and my wife goes down to the, mm -hmm. you know, her tax preparer. Mm -hmm. uh, anything new with the e-filing? Uh, any more? Any new opportunities to save money with it? Uh, I know that libraries are getting hit with a lot more people because the IRS is not sending out forms, so mm -hmm. more people come here and say, "Do you have the whatever?" Yep. Well, well, the e-filing has become a lot more popular, uh, and it's a lot better system than it was early on. Um, there are safeguards built into the system. Uh, it's not that the IRS or states can't make mistakes, but um, they spend a lot of money with their software and building safeguards. Uh, so if it doesn't add, it's going to add up on, a, on there. You're yeah. not going to make a, yeah. right. that kind of a mistake. Right. right. And there's also the, you know, we've had a lot of individuals who in their first year going over to e-filing say, oh, is it safe? Is it going to get hacked? Is it, 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 we, I, you know, there's, you have the chance of just with regular mail of something getting lost, something getting depleted. And there's always that chance, but we've we've never encountered anything on our end that has, has, has made us to believe that it's as not as safe as it can be. Um, and it really provides a luxury to our clients in the fact that you know the direct deposit method it speeds up the process by speeds up refunds three weeks. I mean, mm -hmm. it seems like especially when you get into the heat of battle of between March and April fifteenth, when the majority of the bigger returns are starting to go through process, really kind of slows things down. It seems like direct deposit is a great avenue, and then the other, you know, no one likes paying taxes, so. The direct, the, debit, <laughs> the direct debit portion are, are the part of that, of being able to, you know, uh, I want to, like a firm like ours, you can, you can sign up and have your account information on there and then set it up so that on April 14th it's withdrawn. Uh -huh. So you can actually submit and file your return January 1st if you had all your information, but not have the payment go in. I wondered about that. And, you know, because we have clients who go on vacation, they have things come up, they don't want to be, they're not going to be around, so they don't have to worry about it when they're in Bermuda or wherever they are yep. nice that time of year. Um, so it's, it's just a great opportunity for them to say, hey, take out my payment, take out my first quarter estimate, and I don't have to worry about writing checks and mailing them in and doing certified mail, and it's just... And, you know, that, and then I won't take that uh, loss until it's time that I have to pay it. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, several years ago, people were thinking that if I if I electronically filed today and I owed money, I had to pay it today. But this delayed or deferred debit is a great option. Is that uh, uh, is that available to people who file themselves online? Yes. That, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So just look for yeah. that in your package. Look for that in your software package. Yeah. Okay. And be careful whether it's a direct deposit or a direct debit. Be careful that you're using a checking account, usually a checking account. Double check the numbers mm. to make sure that the routing number and the account number are yours and you haven't entered them incorrectly. Because uh, you might think that you've got a $1,000 refund coming to your account and it mm. might go into your neighbor's account Ooh. by mistake. So yeah. be careful when you put in your account numbers. I didn't even think of that possibility. I was thinking it was wrong and it would just not <laughs> get written and yep. they would say that didn't work. Right. But yep. no, you could lose. I guess you, you might get it back, but this would be difficult. It, it would delay things. It would complicate things. Yep. Um, but we've had, I, I've heard about cases where, you know, people are using software that's simply updated from year to year. And, mm. and they've changed they, something. They've, they've changed a checking account. Yep. 
and they never thought about updating that in the in the software. We do that with credit cards all the time. They go out of date, or yeah. we get a new one. Forget yeah. that we're using it on our Easy Pass right. or something. And, and if yeah. you owe money, you want to make sure come April 15th, if you set it up for that time frame, that you have money in your account. So You have a lot of people who keep their checking account balances pretty low so they can get to whatever interest is available for savings accounts or you know, if they owe a big chunk, they might have to move some money in. So it's great from a, a, a le you know, a opportunity that you can kind of walk away and not worry about it, but at the same time, you gotta make sure that the funds are in there to, a good one. to not you know, inquire or any, any, have any uh, insufficient fund charges or anything like that for your bank or have the IRS say here's you owe us money and now you owe us penalties or interest because it's late or right things like that so you know Richard if I could just make another sure. suggestion with regards to the e-filing um, and maybe I'm old school maybe it's the gray hair of the old school uh, me too even if we electronically file I still like to have a paper copy of mm -hmm. what I submitted to the government in my records um, I can have an electronic copy, you know, on my hard drive, but things happen to hard drives and, and backups. Right. Uh, so I always like to have a hard copy so that if any questions ever come up, um, I know exactly, you know, what has been submitted. Yeah. And is it seven years still? You want to make sure you keep at least seven years, or do you keep further back? Well, the, the statute of limitations on a tax return is three years from the uh -huh. date of filing. Okay. So if there are any issues, uh, any errors, any audit exposure, there's a, generally a three-year statute of limitations. Seven years is a good rule of thumb to hold on to uh, important papers like a tax return okay. or W-2. Yep. But again, the statute, like Tom said, is from the filing date. If right. you haven't and filed or if there's no statute of limitations. So you know, that's, you know, that's key that you, if things are on record and they can only go back a certain amount of time. Okay. Unless fraud or negligence. Yep. Now you mentioned uh, AMT and for a second I was thinking, now what the heck was AMT? <laughs> um, alternative minimum tax. I've seen it. Uh, we've been warned about it in the newspapers. What's going on there? Well, al alternative minimum tax yeah, it's not. It's not your ATM. It's not your. It's not where you're pulling money out. It's it's going the other way. It's it's an alternative tax calculation that was put into into the code, Internal Revenue Code, uh, back in the 70s, I think it was. Wow, is that old? Yeah, it's been around a long time. 30 years. But back back in the 70s and 80s, there were very few people that were subjected to it. There were a few oil barons that were targeted. Uh, they were making a lot of money but they had a lot of tax preference items uh, which reduced their tax bill. And they weren't paying, in the eyes of certain people in Washington, their fair those oil share. barons weren't paying their fair share. Yeah. Um, over the years, the preferences and the deductions that are factored into this alternative tax calculation have been expanded uh, in such a way that many, many people, uh, I would say that uh, Roughly 40% of our clients are subjected to AMT today. 40%? 40%. May, <laughs> may even be higher. Yeah. Wow. May even be higher. Uh, now, part of why our percentages are high here with our firm and here in the area is that we live in New York State. And well, our. We all do, and it's going to be watching this show too. Our, our <laughs> income taxes and our property taxes are high, and those are two adjustment items that come into play, uh, the taxes that I pay to the state of New York are not deductible. They don't reduce my AMT exposure. They do reduce my regular tax exposure, but not my alternative minimum tax exposure. Uh, same thing with taxes on my house. Um, so unfortunately, over the years, we mentioned earlier Brackets. about indexing and, and mm -hmm. inflation. They've not indexed <coughs> AMT, so more and more people have been subjected to this AMT. And uh, uh, it's a tax that's calculated at the same time that you calculate your regular income tax. You pay it along with your regular income tax return. Um, Is there a table? I don't recall exactly how that worked. Oh, it's a, it's a two-page form. Yeah. And, uh, and how do you know you're, you're going to be filling that form out? <coughs> I would suggest to any of your any of your viewers that if you're filing a tax return, and if you have uh, on a joint tax return, if you have in excess of fifty thousand dollars of income, 
I would suggest that you read up on this. Go online, check out form 6251. Yep. And that's the alternative minimum tax, or okay. the AMT tax. And uh, it'll probably take you three hours to read the instructions, <laughs> but uh, you should take a look at it. And especially if you're using some software, uh, the softwares have been pretty good at, at picking up on the AMT. Mm -hmm. um, if you're involved in some executive compensation plans, uh, some incentive stock option plans, uh, take a closer look because those, those folks are uh, more than likely subjected to AMT because of some of the income that they're receiving from their employer. Right. Um, but unfortunately, AMT is a big revenue generator in Washington, and we're spending too much money in Washington, and uh, we can't afford, we can't afford to do away with AMT right now. And that's what IRS is saying. Okay. Uh, so it's here to stay. Um, Hopefully, by the time, again, that your viewers are, are watching this show, uh, uh, our leadership in Washington will have patched, and that's an important word. Patched, not patched. patched. No. P-A-T-C-H. P-A-T-C-H, yes. almost okay. like a garden patch. Yep. They need to patch the AMT's laws uh, before December 31st, or millions more people will be subjected to AMT that, that weren't in 2009. So hopefully at least the patch will be legislative or legislated before the end of the year. So that's something to really watch in the news. Yes. And that's what we were talking earlier about how, it, how difficult it's been for us to plan for this upcoming year, for 2010. We've, we haven't been really waiting for the patch to be passed because we knew it would be delayed and delayed and delayed, but we have to estimate on the high side as if this patch is not going to go through. <laughs> And you know, there's a really good chance that you know some of our clients might end up being somewhat highly overpaid. They're ta they might have overpaid too and much tax. And they'll be happy about but, that, but well, no. at the same time, you're you're <laughs> kind of giving the government your money early when you there's oh, no oh, need I to. Um, be, but we've had to put that money in just in case the patch does not go through. So if on December 31st it gets passed or whenever it may be, you know, we've had to calculate it as if it's not been there all year. So it's really been tough for us to kind of narrow in and kind of hone in on a number that we feel comfortable with. But we always have to go on the high side because if it doesn't go, you know, now, at least we've covered they've, ourselves. they've but, paid it. So yeah. at least they've already put that out. So it's right. not going to hurt too much more. Mm -hmm. Correct. Real estate, that's been a, a wild ride. Uh, <laughs> we don't live in Arizona and Florida, which is good, but uh, what, what uh, effects of um, real estate issues have we here? Uh, you mentioned something that I had never heard of before the show, which was short selling. It sounded to me like uh, the, the stock uh, manipulators were hmm. out there, but mm -hmm. this has got nothing to do with stocks. Yeah, no, we've, there's, again, it hasn't really affected this area as much. And un for the unfortunate people that it has affected, um, it, it really was associated with the, the housing boom and then the subsequent boom <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> in both directions. Or plop. Or plop, yeah. <laughs> um, so with the housing market kind of taking off and people buying houses at record level highs, and then all of a sudden the economy just falling out from underneath them, uh, you have people whose houses are underwater. Um, their mortgage is more than the value of their house. And we've learned negative equity, a new word that many mm -hmm. of us five years ago didn't know. Plenty of terms that have become <laughs> new to us. Um, so maybe they've lost employment, maybe they have to leave the area for whatever reason. Medical reasons, reasons Medical often. reasons, without a doubt. The medical bills racking up and racking up. Um, they may have had to sell their house for less than what's owed to the bank. Um, the bank then issues uh, what's called a 1099C to the seller of the house saying that this is the amount of mortgage or this is the amount of the debt that was forgiven. Um, and in the past, a debt forgiveness is normally a taxable event, but because of um, was it the Debt Recovery Act? Debt Re it was a 2007 legislation when the mortgage crisis really started to hit. Right. That uh, Congress put some tax breaks in for, for individuals right. who lost their principal residence Okay. And uh, so as Kevin said, if, if the bank is forgiving, let's say $50,000, mm -hmm. uh, not holding the individual responsible, the house is For gone. For taxes. Yeah. Um, 
the government is not going to tax the individual on that fifty thousand dollars that they were forgiven, you know, mm -hmm. in, in mortgage debt. Right. Now that's just for your principal residence. Right, just for your principal residence. And there's a form that needs to be completed because that 1099C is all, a copy of that is also going to the government. So, um, so there is a form that has to let, make them aware that this is the principal residence, and therefore it would be excluded underneath the, the Debt Forgiveness Act of 2007. Um, but it's something that in the states of you know Nevada, Florida, California, you've seen yeah. a lot more of. But it's definitely something out there. There's some we won't get into it because of the the difficultness. But there's also some avenues for. Uh, credit for card forgiveness, business debt forgiveness, things like that, but they're much more intense. Um, this might not be something you would want to do at home, as they say. This I is would maybe definitely for professional not. drivers. Yeah. Well, not you need a professional driver. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Richard, if I could just comment, uh, you mentioned real estate, and and this was, you know, the the case where somebody sold real estate at a at a loss. Mm -hmm. um, there was some great legislation in 2008, 2009, 2010 for some first-time home buyers. Okay, some good. great tax breaks for people getting into their first home, mm -hmm. and uh, and that might also use up some of the foreclosed homes. Is that connected at all? Well, some people are buying up foreclosed homes, you know, and getting them back on the tax roll. But mostly not. It's no, no. It's mostly you know first-time home buyers that uh, that are finding a way to you know to get into their first home. And, uh, and up to an eight thousand dollar tax credit, a refundable tax credit, to help people get into those first homes, and uh, and unfortunately, right off the top of the yeah yeah it comes right off the top, yep. and uh, and we've seen some cases where uh, if it weren't for that tax credit, some people were having a difficult time coming up with a down payment. So right. for a short time, they were using the government's tax credit. Um, to pay know. back mom and dad for the, yeah. <laughs> the down payment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, unfortunately, um, as we see on occasion, there are some bad people out there taking advantage of these incentives. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of fraud earlier this year detected uh, with regards to the first-time homebuyer tax credit. Mm -hmm. People that didn't buy a house claiming the credit and taking the money and trying to run with it. Ah. Uh, now, to tighten that up, uh, in order to claim the tax credit, qualifying people, and there's dates involved. Now, we're, we're going back now. You had to have had a contract in place by April 30th of 2010. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you've had to close by September 30th. But there are some people that that bought homes and weren't aware of this credit or didn't think so that they, they would qualify. Still, yep. They could still claim the credit. Okay. Yep. Uh, but when they do that, They'll need to get a copy of their HUD-1 statement. It's that long closing statement that summarized oh, yeah. the craziness that they went through at the closing. It's been about 10 years for me. But. <laughs> yeah. they'll, they'll have to attach, they'll have to sign a copy of that HUD-1 statement and actually send it in to the government along with their tax return. Mm -hmm. Those folks can't e-file. They have to right. send in the old paperwork. It's hard weight. to send that in on the e <laughs> Yeah, Because yeah. the government, rightfully so, the government wants to make sure that that's a legitimate purchase. Right before they cut you a check for that $8,000 refund. Right. And a, got great, enough fraud. and a great way to speed up that process as well, because obviously you know, $8,000, people want to get that back, is to amend the 2009 return. Uh, and, and you know, people are always scared about amending. They think the IRS, you know, well, this is, an, audit it, me now, sure. this is an issue the IRS is going to be very skeptical about, regardless if you do it on amended return or on an okay. original return. There's no added risk. But to speed up the process is to do amend your 09 return now if you qualify for this, get the new form that's required that go in it with the attached HUD statement, and that can get the, the, the clock rolling a little bit sooner than waiting to do it with your 2010 return, and then it gets submitted with the thousands and millions and millions and millions of other returns that are going in at the same time. So to get that clock ticking a little bit sooner would be a good opportunity to do that. Yeah, that, that's one of the few opportunities yep. where actually a, a 2010 transaction can be rolled back. Yep. To your 2009 return. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go into it. We're getting a little short on time, but let's <laughs> let's go into a little bit the uh, IRA situation. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been told again, maybe a Roth is for you. You know, we're starting to see that in the Sunday paper in the Wall Street Journal little section. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing the word Roth. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going on? Well, years ago, I believe it was a senator, Senator Roth. Senator Roth. 
remember him. Uh, proposed and, and uh, got enough people behind him in Washington that a, a Roth IRA is potential for, uh, for many people. Uh, and the great thing about a Roth IRA, a lot different than the traditional IRA, you can contribute. You have to be working. You have to have earned income. Mm -hmm. And you can contribute up to, what is it, $5,000 yeah. into a Roth IRA. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, um, that account will be invested wisely and profitably, and that account will grow over the years. And you have to let it park. It, it's really a retirement account, just like a regular IRA, but it's designed to be parked and invested for a long time. And the growth on that account goes untaxed. Because mm -hmm. you've already paid everything. You've already paid tax on the, the initial contribution. So in my example, let's, let's say you, you only put $4,000 in, and um, and you don't make any other contributions. Make it easy. Okay. You make one-time contribution of 4000 and you're fortunate that you double your money. Uh, when you retire, the account's worth $8,000. Well, that growth, that $4,000 profit will go untaxed. Mm -hmm. um, we recommend highly the Roth account, especially for younger people. With that long horizon. They've got that long horizon. They might be in a low tax bracket right now. Yeah. Uh, we've seen we've seen some high school kids that uh, they aren't going to pay much income tax at all. Right. They're smart enough to invest in this, huh? Well, mom or dad or oh, grandma yeah. might might help them out, <coughs> which, which is legitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, mom or dad can gift money mm -hmm. for a child to put money into a Roth, but if a young uh, man or woman have got a you know three or four thousand dollar IRA or I'm sorry W two for working over the summertime. They'll qualify for a Roth account, mm -hmm. and uh, that three or four thousand dollars that they contribute to the Roth um, could grow to thirty thousand dollars by the time they retire. Right. right, and we've never had a stock market that uh, went down after thirty years. That, no. That's a pretty good horizon. No, no. so it's been proven to be not necessarily safe. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but in the standpoint of, you know, in that situation of being able to pay the tax now. At 10 percent, 15 percent, you know, because you have to have make contributions with post-tax dollars, after-tax dollars, so pay the tax at 15 percent, and hopefully upon retirement you might be in the 28 percent bracket, whatever it may be. So that's you really can just see the, the 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 additional gain in savings and tax right off the bat. Um, so it's it's something that's it's it's a great vehicle. Um, employers are now making it a part of 401k plans. Um, the Roth vehicle, a part of 401k plan. So the, obviously a lot of people understand that the benefit is there for sure. Um, but with regards to the Roth, there's also the, the opportunity for the Roth conversion that's been around for almost since the Roth started. Mm -hmm. Right, um, especially because people didn't have it, so they, they made it possible to immediately start one. Right, and so if you have a regular IRA that you want to convert to a Roth, if your income, if your adjusted gross income was over $100,000 in the past, you were never allowed to do that. You were never allowed to convert your IRA to a Roth. Starting in 2010, they've gone away with that threshold of $100,000. And so you have to see a lot of people that are thinking, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old now. I'd rather pay the tax now because a lot of people think the rates are going to go up. And then there's a lot of people out there that think, I'd rather when I retire not have to pay any tax. I'm going to be on fixed income. I want to know what my income's going to be on a day-to-day -day level, and I don't have to worry about the government. And, and isn't it true that if you just get a, a, a section of your income that doesn't have tax, now that's going to make it easier for you to avoid a lot of taxes with the rest of it? Let's say you have other income that is taxable, mm -hmm. so you're not going to have such a high total, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, one of the, the best thing, one of the biggest advantages of doing the Roth conversion this year is is that any obviously if you, if you convert from an IRA to a Roth you have to make the contribution to the Roth is always standard, with after I guess, tax standard IRA right? it's right standard IRA traditional IRA it's always with after tax dollars so you have to pay the tax on that conversion but you get to spread the tax defer the tax ah. over a 2 year span oh, that's nice. so if you did it right now you wouldn't have to pay you would pay half in 2011 which would be April 12 April 2012 and half in 2012, which would be April of 2013. So there's a great deferral vehicle out there great. for the people who want to take advantage of this. But again, like we say with a lot of our clients, it all depends. It really depends on your situation. And if you have 
the funds outside of the conversion to pay for the tax that you're going to incur. Um, so it, it, with a lot of things we say, it really comes down to your situation. Great. We are about out of time. Is there anything you'd like to add to all this? Uh, oh, let's find out how they could reach you just in case uh, somebody wanted to. Uh, mm -hmm. Phone number? Email, well, our, our phone number, our phone number here in, in the Albany area is 785-0134, mm -hmm. and we're out on the internet under www.marvincpa.com, yep. and uh, we've got an electronic newsletter um, that we have a bunch of clients, non-clients that subscribe to. It's a bi-weekly letter that comes out with great tips for personal and business income tax. Oh, well, there's a bunch of tips right, right there. If you want to get on that newsletter, you can go out to our website and subscribe right there or email Tom and I. Our, web, our email addresses are out there, and we'll get yeah. you on the list. Be glad to help. Great. Yeah. Well, Tom and Kevin, I want to thank you for helping us maybe smooth out some of the wrinkles and understand a little bit about some of the problems we're facing as we fill out our taxes for 2010. Great. Well, thanks for having us and uh, mm -hmm. uh, hang in there with Uncle Sam in, in New York <laughs> State. Taxes are going to continue to be a burden, but uh, if you take your time and, and uh, conscientious record keeping and, and seek professional help when you need it, uh, we'll do okay. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And I want to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show, that you tune in again next time, and you have a great week. Take care. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.